Hello, you're listening to the OMG MotoGP podcast with former Grand Prix rider and British champion Keith Ewan, myself, Amy Reynolds, and I'm delighted to say that today we are joined by former World Beat commentator and current Rookies Cup commentator Matt Dunn to talk all things Texas. That was an absolute barnstormer of a MotoGP race. It really got all the feels going. Uh, just before we delve into that, uh, can I just say, if you want to find out more about our YouTube and Patreon memberships, visit the links below. Your support means we can keep this show on the road and we absolutely want to because Maverick Vinales became the first most GP rider to win with three different manufacturers. Over and above that, there was so much action in that MotoGP race. I mean, if there was ever an advert for MotoGP, that one certainly did the job, didn't it, Keith? Yeah, and Coda's normally so boring, isn't it? We've said, we've complained about it before in the past that Coda's never had some great races, but it all kicked off. I mean, if you're watching it on Friday and Saturday as well, qualifying was bad enough. Jorge Martin, it looked like he was on some kind of steroid. Um, going, He crashed twice in, in one session. It was uh, spectacular how desperate everyone was to get themselves on the front couple of rows of the grid. Um, and then, of course, right at the very start, uh, Gabarini, Christian Gabarini, running through with a fender in his hand to, to change the front fender on on uh, Pecco Bagnaia's bike. I mean, it, it, there was all sorts of things going on in the background as well. It had a real tension about it. But I always think the Americans, they do it so well, don't they? Big American flag flying at the top of that massive Great Hill, fly by jets, national anthem. The whole thing is always done really, really well. And a little more in the way of attendance, I think, as well at Cota this time around. I think that the fact that Trackhouse were playing, you know, we've got the, the two new Trackhouse MotoGP bikes out there resplendent in the in the uh, Stars and Stripes. That makes a difference as well. Joe Roberts, obviously, has been going pretty good, so um, he might have put a few on the gate. So all in all, fantastic atmosphere to start the race, and then what a cracker. There hasn't been one better than that for a while. You're absolutely spot on. And Matt, I mean, all three of us are in the same boat. We're normally on-site present to feel all of that energy and, and enthusiasm and everything. And like Keith just said, it was really cool to see such a great turnout there. Yeah, yeah. It's um, it's a shame they don't actually publish the official attendance figures. I did note that yesterday. Um, Obviously, in previous occasions, it, there's a bit of a reason for that when you got about 400k through the gates for F1, maybe 40 for Murder GP doesn't look so good. But um, I would have said yesterday for race day, it looked much more packed than perhaps I've ever seen it. And that, that was absolutely awesome. I've got to say, uh, you're on site all the time, Matt. I, I mean, I've got to ask you this. There's quite a lot of developments going on behind the scenes as well that you're obviously well in touch with. And, and I wonder what the feeling is across the paddock. Now it's all settled down with Liberty. But more than that for me is the, the Yamaha situation. I mean, it looks like, yeah, the announcement that obviously Cotteraro has re-signed, so big bucks we're talking. Yamaha investing, obviously. And then the announcement that Lynn Jarvis, manager, manager, ah, can't say managing director of racing, um, is rolling over as well. That, for me, is massively significant that Yamaha are really, really chucking everything at this for a, for a result. Yeah, I think like for for Lynn's case, I did see that um, that that is obviously just such a, a huge change. I mean, there was lots of people linking Fabio's words uh, on his re-signing about uh, there them being some confidential moves happening or something like that in 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 Yamaha, which is why he was convinced to stay on. And I don't I'm not sure whether that would be linked to that. He did then later say I did see in, in his debriefs, I think Friday or Saturday, that he expects Lynn to be around quite a lot still, but just mainly sort of stepping away. But how that actually manifests, yeah, who, who knows? But, uh, I mean, we didn't get a bigger advert for drastic change needed at the Japanese level of MotoGP than this weekend really did we. It was extremely unfortunate uh, for both Yamaha and Honda, which I think is probably quite a charitable way of saying it. I think you'd I be mean, very, very, yeah. I mean, yeah. most of the Hondas ended up on the floor, <laughs> didn't they? Yeah. Um, well, did you read after, the Yamaha oh, press release? No, what did it say? We'll talk about trying to put a positive spin on things. They were kind of touting Fabio's bit more of comeback. And okay, arguably he did have a comeback in that race, but it just it's it's not the kind of headlines you want to be reading, isn't it, when you're Yamaha or Honda? No, no, certainly not. I think that's um yeah, it's pretty grim reading across the board, isn't it? Um, especially when you consider of course Alex Rins managed to to get wins in Coda previously, both on Suzuki and then last year on Honda and like yeah, and he just couldn't make it happen. I think he said that, that he took a, a big setup change, a bit of a gamble 
yesterday and it just didn't work out. Um, but that's the stage they're at. They're basically gambling going into races because they're just treading water at the moment, aren't they? They're not, they're not doing front crawl or anything. It's, it seems reading between the lines, right? Go Talking on, to gambling, Amy. Yeah, uh, go on. <laughs> How much did you have on Rin? <laughs> did you... I didn't put him in my actual kind of sprint race or MotoGP race bet, but um, yeah, I think like Matt said, he hit the nail on the head with that one. The fact that someone that we both said was um, like a Kota specialist um, and then you've got the guy that won the race. I bet he's really happy now that his time with Yamaha came to an end. It kind of, his fortunes have all come together really from Albert Vinales. Let, let's have a quick chat, shall we, about the, some of the moves that might be made. I mean, you know, these signings have gone through and, and, and I noticed there was more talk of Alicia Spargo maybe ending up with a, like his brother in a, a test rider role come 2025. And, and Albert Valera manages both Alicia and Jorge Martin. And, and we're wondering about Jorge Martin a little bit at the moment. And obviously, that's kind of a Prilia connection. And with Aprilia going quite as well as I mean, Mav, Batmav, as he's now badly known. Um, Bat yeah, Mav where did is, that is, come from, honestly? Yeah, just yeah, honestly. I mean, it's great and it's working for him and it's cool, but where did he is pluck it? that from? I guess, you know, it's, some, it's something. You know, it, it's like, I mean, at least people who watch it are going to be like, oh, I like the Batman rider. You know, yeah. have well, to know the Batman rider, he, he's pretty much bolted on now, isn't he, Aprilio? I mean, now that this, the, you know, the, 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 a back-to-back, a double at the weekend, we'll get to that in a minute. But but the other space, you've got to say, must be fairly well and increasingly sought after, you would imagine, with the way things are going. And the likes of Hawaii Martin, bearing in mind that, you know, like I said, Albert Valera, his, his manager, might well be looking at that space and uh, maybe moving Alicia across to, to testing and Jorge Martin. Any any traction in the, in the paddock on that one, Matt? Uh, well, my own gut feeling is that, um, that unfortunately, Albert Valera is in a bit of a conflict of interest there, isn't he, with two of his prime riders. Um, wanted to potentially say to one, like, it's going to be better for you long, long term to move aside, mate, and I'm going to move the other one in. Um, because honestly, if, if Jorge Martin, he's, he's dead, sir, that he's going to leave Pramac. Um, he's absolutely dead, sir. He's, he's going to leave it. He's either going to be on a factory Ducati or he's not. Uh, and he's not going to go anywhere else, is he? Um, so... Where else can he go um, if he wants that factory seat? I was chatting with my other half yesterday watching it. I just thought, you know, you look at, okay, the Aprilia is incredible in the hands of Maverick in that race, but Martin, he is in the same way as Pekka is. He's absolutely at one with that Ducati. How much better can it get, you know, for him uh, in, in that respect? His, his run of podiums only just come to an end now. Although the 2024 Ducatis seem to have just a little bit of uh, lacking a bit of finesse at the weekend. I mean, it looked like they were suffering from chatter and the light. Didn't matter whether they were on medium tyre, soft tyre in the back. They definitely had a bit of chatter problems. Peko, I think, was complaining of it. And some of the others on the 2024 bike were as well. Yeah, it didn't look great for them, didn't it? Um, I mean, you do. I mean, they weren't exactly that far away. It wasn't as if it was a, it was a horror show like the Japanese manufacturers had by any stretch, was it? But... They certainly weren't um, as strong as, as you like to think. Uh, did we ever get to the bottom of why Gabarini was sprinting towards uh, no. the grid and everything? Uh, I mean, yeah, bizarre. Uh, you've got a fender in his hand and he was running down the grid for the sprint race. It was literally a sprint race for Gabarini, which is pretty unusual. I mean, uh, and, and and was there any connection between what he was doing and what they were bolting on the bike when the thing leapt in the air at the start of the sprint race? I mean, that, that, was, that was definitely a malfunction. I mean, nowadays, you pretty much just dump the clutch and away you go. But... But um, Bang Nye's bike just leapt in the air and he lost all that time at the at the start, which is critical in a sprint race, 10 laps sprint race. Um, so I I haven't heard whether there was any connection between what had gone on there or whether it was just a, a slight malfunction in some way, shape or form with the front of the Ducati. Yeah, there's just so many factors at play, isn't it? That's um, uh, in that kind of thing. And obviously he was... He, he was, uh, Bang Nye was very choice in his words about what happened on Saturday overall in the sprint with him being one second off, you know, stating very clearly that the only thing he'll change for Sunday is have his different set of tyres on. Um, didn't meaning the compound, he just said the different ones. And, um, you know, that was seems like a very diplomatic saying of him claiming that it, um, I mean, you, you would know better than I do claiming that, oh, he perhaps didn't get a right tire. But then the other Ducatis were complaining of it of similar things too. So 
you know, how much truth is that in there? Like, it's, yeah, a lot of smoke and mirrors for the, for the factory Ducati after that one, I think. What do you say, Amy? Well, Jorge Martin didn't exactly help Peko out at the start either, did he? <laughs> no. <laughs> bit of rough and tumble. It was a bit of rough and tumble. But I do feel we need to have a, a bit more of a chat of the man of the moment because in that first little skirmish, he actually got punted back outside of the top 10. Maverick Vinales, as all of us know, um, he's a real confidence rider. When he's on top, when he's happy, when he's settled, you can really, really see it in the results. And when he has a little bit of a downturn, again, it, it kind of rolls on for him. But he was just on the ultimate high that weekend starting off with the sprint race he was almost i don't want to say untouchable but he was just he he had that little extra something didn't he keith he did and i think that you've just already said it confidence is one of those situations i remember do you know what going back to argentina when bt sport the fledgling as it was then now the the almighty tnt um go everywhere get everything broadcaster um the fact of the matter was back then I remember we were struggling a little bit to get the, the top guys to talk to us. And and Hodgy did a, a turn one at Argentina. He did an interview with Maverick Vinales back in 2014 or whenever it was. And he was just a youngster that was looking alive and sparkling. And he reminds me this year of those years ago. He just, he looks younger. He certainly looks leaner. Um, his confidence is high. He really gets up. That Aprilia looks beautiful. You know, he was doing stuff with that bike that, no one else was managing on the others. And I think that that, for a man like Maverick, as you've said, Amy, that confidence, once he's back to that level, there's going to be no stopping him. I mean, when was the last time you saw him fight the way he did? Uh, try never. Like, yeah. even, even even back when he was consistently winning, like, he, he rarely fought. The only time he really you really remember him fighting was with Marquez at Phillip Island. And he stacked it coming down into the Melbourne loop, didn't he? And... Um, getting his elbows like that. I mean, never seen that before. I've got to hold my hands up and make a public apology. It's a, a group chat with a bunch of old colleagues of mine uh, from Dorna. And um, there's an account on Instagram called Bad MotoGP Memes. And they posted quite a brutal one after yesterday's uh, sprint thing. of uh, it, was a, it was like a caricature of Batman thinking. And it was like Maverick wondering how he's going to bottle tomorrow's Grand Prix. And when Maverick went back to 11th, I sent that to a bunch of mates being like <clears throat> this and this like because I just said yesterday it's like ho ha ha how funny I sent that to them being like he's done it unfortunately it's not going to happen so I got to hold my hands up that was just an unbelievable comeback right because I just when has he ever shown to us in the past that he had it in him to come back from there ever, never right he's always been a quality rider but you're right he's no he, I mean, a bit Jorge Lorenzo-ish when Jorge Lorenzo gets himself out front there's no way that you can sort him out but certainly um <laughs> i was trying to think of a polite way of putting it there for a moment and uh, well, it's one of those situations where maverick is exactly the same once he gets that smooth line and he gets gets away he's very very difficult to uh, get on that kind of pace with but i i think amy summed it up in a word confidence i think confidence at the moment on that uh, aprilia is just superb conversely what happened to aleish i mean aleish you know couldn't make it work for him doing on the on the basically the same motorbike but um just couldn't find the setup to make it work for him. This might be a huge generalization and maybe not well researched, but like just from like a quick, where has Aleish been so far this season? He's not been as much as the front than, or obviously as much of the front as he has been in, in the last or the last two seasons with Aprilia. Yeah, what exactly. you tend to find, what you tend to find in a team. Sorry, Matt. Um, sorry. What you tend to find in a team is that there's always one that is on the rise and the other teammate is 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 finding it difficult to you know confidence and 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 the way that that goes within a team team dynamic is quite difficult to to get around right now mav has got the got the momentum behind him and maybe Aleish and maybe it comes back to what i said earlier on you know Aleish will know that perhaps this is the time this is his last year maybe that is already rattling around in his head that by the end of the year he's going to be a test rider and someone's going to be sitting on his motorbike for next next year in the, in the uh, factory team. And that has a, a, a devastating effect. doesn't matter how hard you're trying or how hard you're trying to put that to the back of your mind as a rider. It's there, and it affects your performance. You know, everything 
at this level, it's all above above the eyebrows, you know. By yeah, by yeah. at this particular, with everybody within a few thousands of a second around there, whatever motorbike you're on, it's above the eyebrows that makes it work. This is what I love about um, when you when you have folks who say like, I don't like the off track drama, I hate the drive to survive aspect of or drive to survive vacation of the sport because they don't like the off track storylines. Just let them get on and ride. And I always turn around to those people and go, but what happens off the track does directly impact what happens on it. And I really do think you're absolutely right when you say Alash is thinking about those things at the moment. It's rattling through his mind. You know, he was already unhappy about having a bit of a seeming pay cut at his last contract renewal. He was like, oh, I wanted more respect from Aprilia. And it's like, they, they're like, well, you know, we almost had Fabio Rocotteraro knocking at the door and, and things. And there's rumors that obviously Fabio turned down about four million or something like that that was quoted from Aprilia. And Alash came into this weekend saying, well, Aprilia told me that they, they never contacted Fabio and stuff. And not telling me that although they are 100% or 99.9% focused while they are on the track, and you have to be, you're not telling me that those things don't pop up in their minds when they're feeling that a gap's increasing and they're going, shit, yeah, I need to crack on because of X, Y, Z, right? He's the oldest bloke of the grid. He'll have seen it, been there, done it. He knows what goes on behind the bike sheds when it comes to these deals. They're going on yeah. all, the, all the time. It never, ever stops. So, I mean, Aleish knows exactly what the crack is. Uh, you know, and, and that will be wearing him down slightly, I suppose. Oh, it was interesting, uh, Massimo Rivola talking about uh, uh, needing a title sponsor. I mean, I have never seen a factory team chuck it out there on a live broadcast. Again, TNT, well done, TNT, for getting Rivola on and getting him to say this kind of stuff. But... I mean, throwing it out there like that, we need we need a headline sponsor, um, which is one of the reasons probably why they weren't able to do a deal with Quattararo. If you've got 12 million euro on the table on one side of the fence and, and a full commitment from Yamaha to, to make that bike work for him, and it, by the time we get to particularly the 2027 rules, I know it's a long way down the road still, um, and you've, you've perhaps only got 4 million euros to play with, um, doesn't work. A third of the price, I'm afraid, um, Stock value is is very important, and uh, I can see why Quattararo stayed with Yamaha, certainly fiscally. Well, someone whose uh, their stock is very much on the up is, of course, Pedro Acosta. He was once again absolutely ph- phenomenal, and and so entertaining to watch. It has been such a long time since I can remember watching someone and just the way they ride and and their commitment and their DF attitude to everything just makes me so excited to watch it and he's just got that like we've spoken last week about his his style and just the way he kind of is he attacks the corners he is sensational to watch and back-to-back podium podiums in in your third race it's I mean we can't really sing his praises any more than we already have all Porter of Athen his crew chief just makes me laugh he's obviously so delighted to be working with him <laughs> I think this is one for Matt, isn't it, really? I mean, Matt's Yeah, for touched, sure. He's touched on the drive to survive thing. And this kid is heaven sent. 19 yeah. years old, fantastic sense of humour, massively fast, sticking out the likes of Mark Marquez and all the other guys that are around him any given time. Surely, you know, he is... Liberty have really landed... You know, the stars are aligning for Liberty at the moment. Yeah, exactly. It couldn't be a better time, could it? You know, it's got sort of, yeah, and I'm not even going to do him the disservice of saying it's got vibes of Valentino when he came around in 2000. Not that I was even that conscious then not watching it because I was quite young, but, you know, you know, you read back through the history books, or the same thing when Mark came around in 2013. I don't think it would be fair to say, oh, it feels a little bit like that. No, Pedro is something completely different. And I think one of the biggest things is I've, I'm obviously very well connected being in Rookies Cup with, with the people who do genuinely know him best. Um, and, and saw the rise um, of him through, you know, from basically run, not having much money and it was all on the line in Rookies Cup in 2020 to, to make a go of it uh, and to show what he can do. And even those people that he still was super well connected with all the way through to last year in his second year in Moto2, his third in World Championship, they're still amazed by what he's doing. Yet they shouldn't be because they know exactly what he's capable of, if that makes sense. And that's I think, really telling of, of how impressive he's been. I think sometimes, though, Matt, kids run out of momentum. You know, you get to a certain stage in life, Moto3, Moto2, you know, but MotoGP, he's made for it. It's working out for him straight away. I mean, Moto2, he struggled a bit more with than he is with Moto2, MotoGP. It's a, it's a tough class. This is, you know, when I talk about what's north of the eyebrows nowadays, you know, 
I was speaking to Cal Crutchlow the other week, which will be out here on OMG Matter GP at some stage soon. Um, you know, he's only 38 years old and he's confused about all the buttons and knobs and bits and pieces you've got to press and work out and the order of everything. Um, so a, a gaming youngster of 19 years old, <laughs> he's used to all this stuff. This is all second nature. And uh, they're, they're putting it together. He's putting it together. I just, I can't imagine where he's going to go next. I mean, he's in for a win. There's no doubt about that. But I mean, it's the way he goes about his business. You know, tires, you know, Cota is a place that uses up tires. You know, it really does. And it's something that he's learning, you know, lap on lap, how to manage tire wear so that he's actually got something left at the end of a race. And he seems to have already come across that, seems to have already worked that out. Yeah, it seemed like he actually worked that out after Qatar. Because that was, you know, I was obviously the unseen videos that MotoGP do are fantastic, the behind the scenes stuff. And you can see when he first came in, he sat down in the chair next to Paul Trevath and, and Paul went, so how was the tire management? And they all laughed. You know, just like a proper like, because <laughs> clearly there was none. Um, in Portugal, he already sorted it out. And here, even better. The only reason why he got beaten by Maverick was because Maverick was on another level. It was not because he had cooked his tyres, I don't think. You know, and um, I mean, how incredible is that? Like, he's already sorted it. How long does it take others to figure that out? Even the, even some of the best, right? Reminds me of that Days of Thunder. I mean, anybody watched that Tom Cruise movie in the past? Days of Thunder, where he's taught how to drive a NASCAR I'm getting there is a, a very tiny tenuous link of course and we'll go into it in a minute but um where he, he's learned to drive a NASCAR uh, around the racetrack at the the way the crew chief tells him when of course he wins races um, anybody that's not seen Days of Thunder not a great film but you might want to watch it um but it links me to Trackhouse of course because they they had a, a NASCAR race going on down the road at Tex, Texas and also had their two bikes for the first time in MotoGP at uh, Cota at the Circuit of the Americas which was a big deal. And, blowing smoke in my own ear, Rael Fernandez. Hey, he was my, you remember, he was my bold prediction this year, Amy. Ooh. For oh. this weekend? No, he was my bold prediction for this year. We all had to do bold predictions earlier on in the year on OMG MoGP, basically. Oh, of and course, what yeah. Was, what was going to be, what was going to be our, our kind of bold prediction? And I said, um, Rael Fernandez on, on the podium. Okay, he hasn't made it there yet. But blimey, I'll tell you what, that team, that youngster, looking good. Well, he wasn't plucked, was he, to be placed in the MotoGP and albeit a little bit kind of reluctant from his side initially for no reason. He's definitely a talent for sure. He, I think he's, he's... What's the right word? I think he's obviously gone past that phase of being like, okay, I got moved up a little bit quicker than I would like to have done. I'm finding my feet. It's... I, I think you're right, Keith. I don't think it's going to be long before we see him there a lot more regularly on, at the top. Good for Trackhouse, though. At the end of the day, to you know, you know, home Grand Prix is important, particularly from a sponsorship point of view. And I mean, you know, Marx has put a lot of money into this team and he's, he's put a lot of commitment into it. And to see it, you know, we mentioned it last time, Nicky Hayden Hill, the big stars and stripes over the... T I mean, it raises the game. They, 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 we need Americans. We need America in the game. And I think with Liberty now underwriting it, you know, you've got Dan Rosamondo who's part of the commercial operator at, at, at Dorna as well, who's obviously an American that's that's familiar with the marketplace. There's a lot going to happen, in, in I, I think, in a short period of time. I really do. I, mean, I know the Dorna guys are still managing the, 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 the thick bit of, of the work, but I can see so many changes coming at such a huge rate of knots to our sport. And I, I can't see the negatives in it. And I'd be I'd be interested, Matt, to again, you're you're on the ground every single minute of every single day. You know, how that feels in the paddock, how that translates. Um, I mean, yeah, I think well, I think there's a, I've definitely said from talking to a lot of people, because especially in, in Portugal, like going around talking with people anyways, before any of the, the move was announced or anything like that, it was a sense of bit like what are we going to do? Something needs to change. Things need to change here and things like that. I know, Amy, you and I have talked about that after many, many post-race beers over many years and things like that. Um, so I can only imagine it's a bit of bit of excitement. I would link back to one thing about Ralph Fernandez just quickly on the subject of track outs. Is like, that couldn't have been a better time performance for Ralph considering what happened in Moto 2 with Joe Roberts. I mean, make no mistake, at their team launch, Joe Roberts was there with John Hopkins. Um, and made some very good connections there. 
and it's quite clear in Joe's eyes that basically if you want that Moto GP ride, it's there. You just have to go and get the results. And he massively got it, not just in round two in Portugal, but here in the US. So for Raul, I mean, him and Miguel need to watch their back a little bit, I would say, because I would make uh, no mistake if I was the organizers or track house, Justin Marks. Thank you very much, Miguel and Raul. You've been fantastic, but one of you has got to make way because this is a commercial operation. You know, thanks very much, but off you go. We potentially, if, you're, if your results aren't up to it, you know. Matt, do you think that Joe has got it in him this year to perhaps be there a little bit more consistently because that that's the only thing I say sometimes about Joe's seasons is that he shows it on occasion and he might have a good run yeah and then he has he tails off and he dips a little bit it's Joe's definitely got the capabilities his consistency's sometimes been the issue yeah I think so I've obviously for the audience listening I've known Joe for quite a long time like on the inside I've done a couple of small documentary series type things with him in 2020 and 2021 and obviously it was with American Racing last year uh, the actual team itself and I th one thing that really occurred to me yesterday with that ride from him is if there was ever a place where the, the wheels are going to fall off considering he did really well in pre-season testing a respectable result in Qatar podium in Portugal where he previously won at if the wheels are going to fall off and that consistently was going to start to crack, it would have happened yesterday. That's what really impressed me about what he did was there was no more, he will never have any more pressure than he had yesterday. And he basically bossed it apart from obviously getting the P1. He was growing through that one little mistake and he would have been right, you know, another couple of laps and he'd been right there. Joe Roberts yeah. was on for a win yesterday. There's no doubt in my mind about that. He made one little mistake, which took him a bit too far away from, from the lead. Only two points off the championship now. Everything will be uh, aligning for him, perhaps. And sometimes you need the kind of experiences you've been talking about, Matt. I mean, sometimes you need those dips in the middle of the year to know where you've got to work on yourself personally, how you've got to yeah. work out. You know, sometimes you have a dip in the year. Sometimes people have a dip in the middle of the race where just suddenly a concentration just wavers very slightly. Certain circumstances from a rider perspective um, can just take you away from the, from the edge you need to be on consistently now. I mean, I... Motor 3, Motor 2, Motor GP, everybody is on the edge. There is no quarter given at all. We used to talk about quarters being given. They never really were. It was just much more of an amateur sport back in the day when people's fitness was, was much more varied than it is now. People's concentration, people's, you know, the very run-up, the very basic uh, stuff that, that now is not even thought about because it's all been handled in the way that it should be. Um psychology of things i mean we've got more sports psychologists in the paddock nowadays and we've got management so it's it's it is a completely different game and, and joe really just needed to work on that area maybe he's got it covered maybe he has yeah and uh, sorry amy go ahead you go for it, Matt. i was just going to say i know in the american racing team they have got a human performance coach there as well uh jen duffy we worked with her last year she's extremely capable um and so that may well be part of it i don't know how closely she actually works with joe himself but also John Hopkins and his relationship with with Joe is that of almost like a psychologist as well. They are so well connected. John's got a really good uh, bond with two riders he's previously worked with, Joe and obviously Rory Skinner as well. And you can literally see the impact that the connection that they all have together is is really really does help. Um, so I'm not quite. I'd love to find out and, and speak to speak to Joe and the, the team and his family and see what actually a difference is. You know, because it's. It's been a long road. How many years? It's been like six or seven years in Moto Two, and for it to start clicking together now, where it is a now or never kind of case, because he's getting to that age where if you're going to make it to Moto GP, you have to do it right now. Like every single day, you wake up and it's on the table for you. Um, something's clearly changed. That or key piece of the puzzle has been put in place, uh, which is allowing him to do that, and that's just extraordinary, really, from what he did yesterday. So good luck to him for the rest of the year, basically. One of the big questions coming into this weekend uh, that was perhaps on everyone's minds was whether Mark Marquez was able to regain his King of Kota title. He came close, ever so close, uh, but unfortunately threw it away. Keith, what did you make of that? I think Mark Marquez is there or thereabouts. I think they haven't quite found the setup yet. It's quite interesting, some of the interviews that he did um, during the course of the weekend. I think him and Frankie Carcetti have both got the serious face on at the minute, trying to work it out between them. He's crew chief, Frankie Carcetti, of course. Um, they're just not quite there with that motorbike. You can just see it was dead skittery through, through qualifying. He was having to work really hard on it. And 
do you know what? I haven't had time this morning to look back at the tape, but I'm sure where he, he dumped it at turn in turn eleven. You, you're coming into that. It's a you know, it's all action. It's all on the on the move down into turn eleven. It's a bottom gear. You got something like five bottom gear hairpins at, at Coda. It's a proper Formula One type track when you come to dead stops. And I could swear that he locked that front brake up just before he made the mistake. Took him half a yard further down the track than he needed to be when he was actually properly on the anchors, and it went, you know. He was having to squeeze it harder than he wanted to squeeze it, and he, he ended up with a face plant situation. He hadn't even really turned it in. But the bike looked lively all over the place. He was he was making it work for him. He looked good in the sprint race. You know, he was on for a win, I think, in the in the main race. If he if, if yeah, we won't know because we don't know longevity tire wise whether he's got, you know, all of that sorted out as far as the setup was concerned. But I, I just think that just a little way off of the perfect setup at the moment on that bike for, for Mark. Um, but they'll get around it. I believe that for sure. I did see... Do they um, think... Go on, Amy, sorry. I was going to say, um, uh, Frank Carcelli, did you see his tweet this morning saying there, and it was sort of acknowledging what Mark had said yesterday, there was like a slight problem with the front brake, something to do with the pressure. It wasn't... But I, I couldn't really understand his sort of smoke and mirrored words about it, but I don't I suppose you'd have an idea of what that could be. It was like a brake issue they talked about, Keith. Well, I think that the you know, brake pressure is, is you know, obviously you, you couldn't get much more, more brake pressure going through it when you're coming down to turn 11. You've got to get the thing stopped. But it, I, I think the balance is, is, a, is a major problem. Let me take you back to some of the comments that teammates have made when they've written, they've looked at the data of Mark's data. And some of the, the data that comes through for his braking is phenomenal. Nobody can break, you know, Mark's got it locked most of the time. On you know, he, he's he's always locking the front end up, and it shows up on all of the data. And when when the you know his teammates have looked through that data, and well, yeah, if we did it like that, we'd just be on the, on the floor. And I think he's asking more from that 2023 uh, bike than than anybody else ever has done before at the front end. And uh, and he, they've not quite got that right for him just yet, but they will. Can I ask you guys a question? Obviously, it was a real anticipated move for Mark to jump on arguably the best bike on the grid and a guy of his talent. I guess everybody was expecting him to jump on it and start winning races straight away. Was that an unrealistic expectation? And would Mark of, you know, five years ago have been able to make the switch and just make it work right from the off? Good question. It's a very good question in that, you know, we were, the question mark was still whether he was a, as fit, um, and whether he physically could still manoeuvre himself in the way that he needed to do to take the shapes on a motorbike like he did. B, whether age-wise he was moving into an era where you you do trans, you do transition from, from being massively raw talent to massive skill, you know, bravery, you know, meanders a little bit sometimes when you get towards your 30s. You know, things do change. There's no doubt about that in normal life, let alone just in racing life. Um and of course, at the end of the day, he is on a 2023 bike. And I think the difference there, okay, is not so much the bike. Yes, it isn't, you know, the 2024 bike is apparently much better. Whether he'd be able to get more out of it will only depend on, at the end of the day, the data and the backup that he has from the team. You know, the, where he's at a disadvantage, if anything, Grassini does not have all of the factory techs and all of the factory mechanics that, you know, the main teams will have uh, on that bike last year, on, on on the 24 bikes this year. So I think where he's at a disadvantage is Frankie Carcetti, you know, did a brilliant job getting Digi back into the into the fold. In fact, he saved Digi's career effectively by going by, by doing what he did. Um, but you know, there was quite a long conversation. I think that again, I can't remember who was having it. I think Natalie Quirk again TNT. Good job TNT. <laughs> Thank heavens for TNT. Um, was the fact that that he said he was still working on his relationship with with Frankie, you know, and it is a relationship. Is that those little quirks in in how you speak, your little nuances in the way that you explain something, you know, you know, he had thirteen years with his previous you know crew chief. Now, you know, Santi Hernandez and he were joined at the hip, uh, and now he's he's he swapped into a brand spanking new team on a year old bike, which which has advantages in that there are. He will have data from before, but no one, no one has data or sets the boundaries like Mark Marquez on a motorbike. They, they, you know, trying to work out how Mark Marquez does things compared with every other normal human being is completely different. So they're working their way through it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Matt, in the end, Nene Bassinini managed to edge out Jorge Martin of um, a final spot on the podium. You've got to think that one would have stung a little bit on Jorge Martin's behalf. He, he was, I, I mean, like, you guys might have a different opinion, but Jorge Martin looked a little bit scrappy this weekend to me with the two crashes in qualifying. He just, he looked a little bit all, like, skittish, I think is the word I'm trying to find. Yeah, I think um, it comes back to what Kiefer said earlier about um, it with the lace and the off-track things going on in Jorge Martin's head as well, which is why actually, ironically, without the goings-on of Maverick's comeback story, Pedro Costa being amazing, Mark crashing and things like that, actually one of the juiciest storylines yesterday was Bastianini versus Martin because there is still a, a second factory seat in Ducati up for grabs. And so for, for Martin to lose out on that would have really, really stung Um I think it was really, really good for Bastianini because I think a lot of people have sort of written him off a little bit after last year and things like that. He's not quite gelled with it. And that was a good comeback ride for him. But yeah, for Martin, I mean, how do you take that? He's I know he's gone a bit on the, let's say, defensive in the media. His I think his comment was somewhere along the lines of, hey, hey, I mean, it's not exactly that bad a day. It's my first time off the podium this year, which I think is absolutely right. But I do think there's a lot of merit to what you're saying, which is, all weekend he looked a bit ragged. I mean, that that was it qualifying or wherever he had the two crashes. I mean, that's that's quite uncharacteristic, and those are some big accidents too. It's very difficult to bring yourself back. He has a personality that's 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 you know he's quite prepared to fight, and he's quite prepared to you know he's quite an aggressive rider. And I think that bringing yourself back from that to try and calm yourself, you saw all the team around him trying to calm him, <laughs> trying to just get him to you know. Trying to hypnotise him back into being the you know slightly more of a calm weapon than he is, but I think he's just gone over the threshold. I, I can't make a real world analogy. I can't think of a real world thing, but it's it's like you've got yourself into this frustrated fight mode that you can't get out of, and with the amount of adrenaline and the amount of importance, you know, he's leading the world championship at the end of the day. This means everything to these people. There is there's no. There's no way out of it. You know, it's it's all consuming in your head when you're going for something like a world title or or just a, a you know, a race win. It takes over. And to try and bring yourself back from the edge, it's almost like you you're so full of adrenaline. It's, it is like a drug and it's very difficult to bring yourself back, particularly perhaps when a, you've got a person personality like Jorge Marty. Um, you know, and I think that when we get to the next round, I think it will be he, he, he will have analysed everything. The great thing about this as well is, you know, everyone will have, will have gone back into the trucks. You know, it's funny. I was I was reading a piece of one of our favourite journalists who's always moaning about something or the other. Um, but in particular, he was moaning about the, the delay in um, the uh, press meetings that you guys all have at the end of the day because riders want to be on a 3.30 flight. They want to be out of there straight away. And... What he's missed, I, I know that all, all every journalist on site is, has paid his own way pretty much, and, and particularly in this guy's case, you know, he, he is an independent. So at the end of the day, he's paying for everything. He needs to get those those conversations with riders. He needs to download all that information. He needs to get that copy out there. But at the same time, the other side of that is that, the, you know, the riders are keen to get, they want to get to the point where they can analyze what's happened to them. They want to get on that airplane. They want to get to the other end of things. They want to work through what's just happened. They're not in speak to journo mode all of the time. I know it's part of their duty and yes, they should be able to do it, but the teams are in between a rock and a hard place trying to make their rider stay on site for an extra hour rather than catch his flight to go and work out what they're going to do next. You know, if you've had a really, really tough day, you want to be on a flight, and there's no place like an aeroplane, long haul particularly, for just sitting there in your own zone, shut off your first class or your business class seat. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, in business, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Shut the, shut the door, shut the door, and just download all that. And believe me, you want to get to that. You're in such a hurry to be able to sit in a corner and work it out and, and kind of lick your wounds mentally um, to to be ready for when you hold the conversation with your crew chief and, the, and when someone else somewhere else will be downloading data, they'll be working their way through that. The rider will be thinking about every lap, every corner, every breaking point, every manoeuvre. And to sometimes have that that train of thought disturbed by somebody asking you, you know, how was it for you? Um, 
I'm I'm not trying to defend the rider for not doing his duty regarding the press because I think that, that you know, our media is particularly good and they and I don't think anybody realizes just how hard motorcycle media work. You can perhaps elaborate on it, Matt, because you're with them so much. But a lot of these guys are independent. They all turn up. They all pay their own fees for getting to and from racetracks. They all pay, you know, Matt Oxley, uh, David Emmett, Simon Patterson. Sorry, I had to mention his name. Um, there are these guys are all paying their, their their own way. There's a whole group of them out there. So if they if they are overlooked or if they are snubbed by a team or by a rider particularly, it has a material effect on what they're doing for their job as well. Is that a ramble or does that make any sense? Matt? No, no, no. I would have said like, I, that just comes back to what we were saying about Liberty Media. What's that going to do in the future? How are different things going to look? You know, are the riders going to get that choice or not? You know, let's. Uh, who knows? I mean, there's the ways in which Formula One riders, uh, uh, drivers, sorry, do things. I talked for a long time about um, MotoGP riders have a very fortunate on the Thursday when they come in on. Uh, they get to rock up at about half 11. They go to lunch first and then they do the media duties. Okay, on some races, they have a morning of sponsor things or like fan visits or a pre-event. Other than that, if they've got a quiet day, they rock up at 11, 12, have lunch. An F1 driver's in at nine. They are paid about 50 million, you know, a year as opposed to 12, 13, like Fabio's reportedly getting. But, um, but they worked a lot harder. Um, and let's see how that, how that goes um, when when Liberty Rock of Anna say this is more story focused rather than results focused, guys. That's where it's going to be. Well, what do I do what then you... is send send out some Liberty blokes on the back of a motorbike doing two hundred mile an hour, and we'll chuck them up the road at, uh, uh, and and see how they um I'm just recover speculating. from the yeah. stress of doing their job. Yeah. Do you know what Keith um, your chat reminded me of? Is back in the day, not towards the end of his career, but when he was you know still very competitive. Um, you could always tell when Valentino had had a bad day because he would take so long to come out to do his like media debrief and chat to the TVs. If he'd done well, you know, whether that be on a Friday, a Saturday or a Sunday, before we had like the TV set and things like that, he'd be out really quick to chat to everybody and then off to do his things. But if he'd had a bad day, you'd be sometimes hanging around the back of the box in between the two trucks for like, half an hour 40 minutes and i remember you'd have to get on the radio going guys i'm still waiting you have to cover everything else for me but it's so true they want to just block out they, they've got no interest in anything else that's going on that day they want to find out what on earth has happened and what they need to change for it's a, tomorrow it's a balancing act and it's not an easy one because i'm i'm i always fall slightly towards the riders regarding this um although having been involved in media for, for some considerable time afterwards that i i can understand both sides of it and there doesn't seem to be an easy way out of it sometimes because they, they must be committed to, to giving what the media need. Um, but I think sometimes the understanding and, and, you know, sometimes it needs to be an understanding of, of just how tough this job is and, and what you need to do it um, on both sides. There needs to be a little bit of give and take on, on both sides. I mean, John Kaczynski is one of my favorite. He, he was the, the longest it ever took me to get an interview. Me, a cameraman and a sound guy, because we used to have sound guys back then too. Um, I waited, I think, for two and a half hours outside of his debrief. He was debriefing <laughs> for Ducati at the time, and it was at uh, Monza. And we waited outside of his truck for two and a half hours to get this interview. And in the end, I was gripping my teeth, and I thought, no, I'm not going. It was getting dark. I thought, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand here. If it takes till tomorrow morning, I'm going to get this bloody interview. So we stood there. The camera guy was – everybody wanted to go home for some food. And uh, anyway, eventually, John Kaczynski came out and he, he was definitely a bit awkward and he came out and he wanted to sit in this one position on the floor, which meant that I had to get on my knees and the camera guy, in those days, the camera was about the size of a truck. So he's down on his knees with the camera on his shoulder like this. And, and it was a long interview because I wanted to get everything I wanted to get. But the most notable part of it was John K Kaczynski's feet stank. <laughs> all I, re I don't remember a thing he said all i remember is a stink coming from his feet <laughs> yeah were well, your questions like five seconds long <laughs> so what do you think about yeah, that you then want, you <laughs> didn't want to take a deep breath <laughs> yeah no i, I gotta anyway, say i do I, I fully i fully understand and, and um there was i was talking to one one press officer um 
a few rounds ago trying to um because i work a lot with some of the younger riders especially in rookies and try and help them with with the media side social media tips and like how to conduct yourself in interviews and so i was asking them what what's the main problems that they face with the riders especially there too very very good on camera but let's say unwilling to to do go the extra mile with the media side and they said well the justification the rider gives to me about not doing as little as possible is they say okay you want me to do this social media video or this interview with this journalist that takes like an hour what if in that extra hour working with my crew i could have found a setting for sunday's race that meant i could win surely the press you get from that is going to be way better than this one-off interview and and but for as long as he says that, they can't argue that much. But um, but that's just going to be something which which teams and everyone's going to figure out because they obviously the whole thing it's it's a balancing act, isn't it? As everyone likes to say. Let's talk about. Uh, I mean, like the fact is, is that now that we've got Trackhouse in there again with the NASCAR connection. I mean, the NASCAR con- constitution is completely different. You know, whether you're Jimmy Johnson or whoever you are, um, you have to do a certain amount is in their constitution. You have to do a certain amount of, of press stuff. It's that is it. It's in your contract full, full time. I don't know what the contracts look like or with Dorna and through Erta. Obviously the contracts are with Erta. Um, although Erta's contracted to Dorna to, to manage the, the, um, the teams and then the riders. Um, I wonder what that has to say about the media side, because I think there, I think there are room for, for, for quite large improvements on the media side. I, I believe that, um, but it's finding, as you just said, that balance. <laughs> it's a wonderful word that never seems to balance too well. Okay. It's always tipping one way or the other. It does create a little bit of aggravation, and I can understand that from the, for the reasons I've said. You know, like, and and you've just underlined it by saying, you know, if if spending two hours in the corner of the garage working through data trying to get it sorted, who wants to clear off and do an? Hour? I don't know what you're like, man. I I can only think in a straight line. I can only, I can't, I still have a rider's buddy mentality that can only think about one thing at a time. I can only go down that, and I'm, and I'm convinced that motorcycle racers, sportsmen in general, are still the same, that they, they're focused on it. I know that, you know, media studies and all the other bits and pieces you can do to try and make it work out, but when you're actually a sports person that's focused on that tiniest, tiniest thing, thousands of a second, what can give us that? It's really difficult to then break away Okay, let me put it this way. When you're writing something, if you're a journalist and you're writing something, you've typed it out and some devil comes and talks over your shoulder and says, oh, you're coming out for a beer tonight and all the rest of it and breaks your train of thought. And then you have to go back into that thought process of that story that you're writing. And it can be broken up. It can be disturbed by someone disturbing you in the press room, in the media room. Think of that only a hundredfold, which is what it's like at 230 miles an hour. You know, you're trying to work out in your mind, every little tiny detail off the screen, off the, what the crew chiefs are saying, what the, the technicians are all reporting. And then you've got to go off and answer some stupid questions somewhere. Um, it's very difficult. There's a balance. We need a balance, Matt. <laughs> well, it's a weekend off and then we head to Jerez, which traditionally marks the start of the European season. Obviously, it's been a bit different this year. Um, but going into this leg, of, of the championship always used to have like a slightly different feel about it you kind of would always reference the fact that this is where we're going to really start to see you know who's got it this year and who hasn't who's still got work to do um we lead go in there with um Jorge Martin leading the championship just a couple of people I was going to pick out that we didn't cover what happened to them in the race um you guys might agree or not I feel like Marco Bezecchi has been equally a little bit quiet at the start of this season Perhaps we haven't seen his, his true hand so far. And I think it felt like Brad Binder had quite a quiet race on Sunday. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I was just going to say with Brad, I read on, uh, did you guys read as well? He had a, he's either he got a break somewhere, a broken foot, broken bone his foot or hand or something like that from motocross. He he let slip in a media debrief on, on Friday or Saturday or something like that, which, you know, considering how physical Kota is that, that might go a long way to explain his his duff weekend. Story of the week, really, motocross, isn't it? Andrea De Vizioso oh, yeah. injured, bloody... Uh, yeah. you, know, you know, we got Petrucci, World Superbikes, I know nowadays, but uh, Danilo Petrucci, really badly injured. You know, broken jaw and, and God knows what. But uh, and now you mentioned that. I hadn't seen that about Brad Binder. And I wondered why, you know, Jack Miller was, was back on it. 
Um, I wondered why Binder wasn't there or thereabouts, but um, quite often these guys are carrying injuries that, that they don't kind of admit to. You know, they keep it kind of quiet as well, don't they? Particularly motocross ones. The, the motocross training is, is a, a major part of it. Do you remember Danny Pedrosa used to always used to say, because Danny was always a little bit fragile, if he could break something, he would do. Um, he used to do motocross training, but without the jumps, which I think they, I think really is really flat track. <laughs> but anyway, um, it kind of... He, he wouldn't do jumps um, because they are the ones that give you the most injuries. Just ask Danilo. Motocross training used to be a little bit taboo with the, the factories, with the manufacturers. I feel like, I don't know if this is Even 100% back in my true. day, Amy. Yeah. Even back in my day. That's usually because we never gave them the bikes back, but anyway. Cal Crutchlow's comment on um, Andre, I think it was Andre Davizioso's uh, Instagram post made me chuckle when he said, I thought you were meant to be retired. <laughs> yeah. Um, I th- I think... he looks like he's having his meals through a straw as well. Yeah, it looks like he's having a horrible time. He's got like two teeth out as well and, and stuff as well. And uh, Dobby, I mean, he's taking retirement as a signal to try and be a professional motocrosser, hasn't he? That's the irony of his situation is he retired from MotoGP doing more than ever. I think it was Battistella, his, his manager, who had to tell him at some point, I think you were there, Amy, like when we were, we were chatting in the airport one time. And he said to him almost like, you look, mate, you're not going to make it to MXGP. I'm sorry. Like, it's that ship sailed. <laughs> and he was sort of having to put up with that. But yeah, I'm just trying to look through back on Twitter to see where I could find it about Brad. Because uh, I'm sure someone did say it somewhere that he let it slip and, and things. But um, uh, but yeah, oh yeah, it was. I'll, I'll credit him as well. It was it, Patterson said he, uh, he casually let it slip. He broke a bone in his foot riding uh, MX a few weeks back. Right. Well, that answers a few questions on the Brad Binder front. Um, I'm sure we'll find out a bit more about Bez in, in the upcoming races. Um, Keith, what do you think we're going to see essentially going into Hereth? Obviously, we've got a couple of podcasts before that anyway, but just like rounding off Circuit of the Americas, what we've seen in those first few races, it's really quite a tantalizing situation at the moment because there's actually an extra couple of names that I wasn't expecting. Like Maverick Vinales, can we literally put him in as someone that's going to be a little bit more of a repeat performer? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I, I, I mean, he's, he's pretty much done pretty well in the last couple of Grand Prix, hasn't he, at the end of the day? So I don't see any reason why he's not there. But I mean, could we have four more different tracks in the first four rounds? What do you think about it? Qatar, Portugal, Cota, and then we go to Herrera. I mean, fantastic. Yeah. I mean, it's just, people often ask me, what track would you go to? And I have to scratch my head all the time just because we are spoiled with racetracks in, in MoGP of, of how good each and every one of them is. But it, Jerez is old school. I mean, going down to Andalusia anyway, is I always like going down that far south. You can fly into Malaga and drive. You can go down to Gibraltar and, and go across the border into into Spain. You can, you know, There's loads of way of accessing it, which is always great fun as well. The drive there is beautiful. The weather is always you know wonderful. Um, the racetrack is is just the best. I love Jerez anyway. It's a bit old school. Um, I wish I was going. <laughs> I'm sitting here. <laughs> I'm jealous of, of not going to every Grand Prix. Still, I mean, I, 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 if 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 I wasn't married and had you know so many children, uh, I'm sure I would spend my life um, just driving around or riding around um, going to racetrack. Still. Um, it is a great racetrack, and, and and people say, which one would you go to? Well, I would go to Hereth. Hereth is another bucket list one for me. Um, those final three right-handers coming around before you get to the, to the hairpin there are just spectacular. Moto three is flat out. Moto two is damn near flat out. Moto GP, yeah, deep breath, grit your teeth, and um, make it through them if you can. Uh, it's just a wonderful racetrack, and we are going to have again someone else is going to come good. You mentioned already Bezeki. Yeah, there will be. You know, someone else that will pop up and do something brilliantly um, when we get to that. So I'm smiling away because one of my daughters has just stuck her head around the corner <laughs> of the door. <laughs> one it. of the many. I'm glad yeah. she's awake. I would Matt, have... have you got rookies in her, eh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I actually just got back from her F like two days ago. Um, I was there for the Rookies Cup test and um, we were there with KTM and Honda and Aprilia all, all testing as well, as well as Moto2. Uh, the Grassini team was testing with Matteo Ferrari, their their Moto E contender. I think he's a Pirelli tire tester as well, and and stuff for them. So he was on track with them, and um, yeah, it's it's shaping up really nice. So they already two weeks in advance building like the VIP village and stuff like this, and there was paintwork going around and and everything. So it was um, yeah, pretty excited. Rookies will be there, their first race of of twenty twenty four, 
Um, that was that will be incredibly exciting. It's it's one of the only free to watch championships that there are, by the way, everybody. Uh, Red Bull TV, so it's completely free, unlike Video Pass. A bit of a plug. Um, if you could put over see in my mug on it, um, but it, yeah, it's um, it'll be really, really exciting. I I must say I. If there's ever a place I think we'll see Acosta get his first win, I'd like to see it, and I think it would be Jerez. He loves it there. The only reason why he didn't win in Murder 2 there last year is because Sam Lowe's had one of those like mystical, magical, in-the-zone rides where he just felt like he was floating, almost like an out-of-body experience. Um, other than that, Pedro loves that. He loves perform. Uh, well, we, we can see. We all know it. He loves performing in front of people. He's a real showman. So I imagine that pressure there he will only absorb it and use it to go faster so he'll be he'll be my tip for for Jerez for sure i reckon great to have you on matt um thanks for having me pleasure chatting with you as always and guys do get in touch with us uh, you can follow us on socials at omg motor gp or send us your thoughts comments questions opinions to omg motor gp at gmail.com you can also send us a little cheeky voice note but we'll be back uh, of course, next week with more OMG, most GP. Thanks very much for listening. Mm-hmm.